Good morning and welcome to Mountain View. I'm so excited to be worshiping with you all this morning. If you're willing and able, would you please stand? And if you're out in the lobby, would you come on in? There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robes as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises he there's a sound there is a sound that I love to hear it's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray where we worship he
Lord, we welcome you into this place. We sing your praise. God, we adore you. the medicine the only cure for everything I feel within redeeming what was lost in all that could have been oh this is a healing kind of love and 
you are the truest friend staying through the night when I was at my end comforting my heart till it was light again oh this is a faithful kind of love mm, we sing everlasting and everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, you hear with me. Wonderful Counselor, the government is resting on your shoulders. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right now with us in this moment is our Heavenly Father. Whatever you've walked into the room with, whatever you've brought with you this Christmas season, whatever you're, whatever you're carrying, the weights, the burdens, the overwhelm, the despair, the frustration, the loss, what you've brought into the room with you today. I want you to hear not only in song, but through scripture that to us, to you, a child is given. A son has been born and the government will rest on his shoulders. The, the, the pains that you bring in to the room this morning will rest on his shoulders. And so as we, as we sing once more to just this chorus, I want to encourage you to take on a posture of giving whatever you're carrying back to God. Because this Christmas, he invites us to hand over the weights that are holding us back from the life that he's called us. So let's sing this chorus one more time. Father, we, we turn over everything that is weighing us down. God, this morning we say together as a family that we trust you. We trust that you are enough. We trust that you've been given to us to carry the weights that we were never designed to. And so, God, this morning I pray that we would begin to trust you in new ways as, as our wonderful counselor, knowing that you are the mighty God that we need. God, we thank you for this moment, this season, to pause and to remember the grace that we've been given. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. This morning, I'm excited to uh, introduce uh, once again my friend, uh, Dr. Ken Baugh. Ken has been a pastor a long time uh, here in South Orange County, and he has uh, spent some time with our staff this week, and I'm excited that he's spending some time here with our church family. So would you all give a warm Mountain View welcome to Ken Baugh. Well, good morning. Great to be with you. I bring you Christmas greetings from Nashville. That feels weird to say because I was born in Southern California, so anyways. You know, I was, as I was uh, thinking about what I wanted to share with you this morning in light of some of the things that I shared with, when I was here a few months ago on the dynamics of Christ formation, as kind of part of this Advent series uh, that you're in, and we're going to be looking at Isaiah 9-6, which, as you know, are different titles that are given to the Lord Jesus. And one of the things that I've discovered kind of gets in our way of Christ formation is distorted perceptions of who God is. And so scripture is what informs us specifically as to who he is. And this morning, we're gonna look at Christmas maybe through a little bit of a different vantage point because the title of my message is Dreading Christmas. Yeah, so aren't you glad you came to church today? But I was reminded of this uh, through just some of the Christmas things that we watch, 
you know, during this time of year. Uh, one of those is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dixon, Dixon, Dickens that he wrote back in 1843. You may not know this, but there's over 20 different adaptations of this particular story. Uh, let me see if you recognize any of these. Uh, back in 2019, on uh, the cable channel FX, you had Guy Pierce who played Ebenezer Scrooge in a pretty raw depiction of kind of the darkness of human nature. If you haven't seen that one, it's excellent. Uh, if you're looking for maybe a more lighthearted version, there, of course, is the uh, Mickey Mouse Christmas Carol and the Muppet Christmas Carol back in 1992. Uh, if you're a Star Trek Next Generation fan, then you'll want to watch Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Patrick Stewart uh, play Scrooge in his rendition in 1999. Uh, who can forget Bill Murray's uh, shot at this? Back in 1988, it's definitely distasteful at times, so I'm not necessarily recommending it, but I've heard that it's a little interesting twist on the story. And then uh, the most recent version with Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds is Spirited, and again, a little distasteful in some spots, but very interesting take on this. And you all know the storyline. Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by three ghosts from Christmas past, present, and future, and they reveal to him or show him different scenes from his life that have shaped his heart in this way of bitterness and resentment and really hatred of, of, of all humankind. And in the end, thankfully, Scrooge sees the errors of his ways, finds a new lease on life. But the Christmas Carol reminds me that all of us have painful memories and life experiences that tend to get amplified during the Christmas season. It's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year, but the reality for a lot of people is it's just not. In fact, one survey revealed that 45% of Americans actually struggle with great sadness during the holiday season, during Thanksgiving, during Christmas, during New Year's. So I kind of wanted to go after that this morning and talk about how Jesus as our mighty God can be with us in the midst of these, what I'm gonna to call to as kind of the ghosts of Christmas, our sadness of the past, our loneliness in the present, and our longing for the future. So back in Isaiah 9, 6, the title, Mighty God, is actually a compound Hebrew word of El Gabor. And so El uh, stands for Elohim. It's kind of the singular form of Elohim, which is used to describe who God is. It's the name of God over 2,700 times in the Old Testament. And it's a reference to God as the supreme one or the one true God. It's the very first reference we have of God in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. In Isaiah 9.6, Elohim is an indirect reference to Jesus Christ that is revealed directly in the New Testament. Jesus is equal to Elohim. For example, in John 1.1, John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Colossians 1, 15 to 17, Paul reminds us that he, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, that word firstborn does not mean that Jesus was the first created, as if Jesus were a created being. In the Old Testament, the word firstborn is used as a reference to status. So Paul's use of the word here essentially refers to Jesus preeminence and supremacy over all creation. Paul goes on to say in verse 16, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and get this, and in him all things hold together. So not only did Jesus create all things, he is actively engaged at this very moment, holding everything together. So you can literally say he has the whole universe in his hands. 
So this idea of Jesus being El is that he is the sustainer and creator of all. The Hebrew word Gabor, translated here as mighty, uh, can refer to God in four different ways, depending on the context. It can refer to the God of strength, the God of power, God as hero, or God as warrior. And again, Jesus' life gives evidence to all of these titles. For example, Jesus revealed his divine strength by raising himself from the dead, John 2, 19. Jesus reveals his divine power as the creator of the universe and the sustainer of all things that we just looked at. Jesus is our divine hero who came to earth 2,000 years ago to save us from our sin by taking our place on the cross. Jesus is the divine warrior who conquered our greatest adversary, which is death. Revelation 1.18 and 2 Timothy 1.10. So why is this important? Why is it important to know that Jesus is the mighty God? Simply because of this. What you believe about Jesus is going to determine whether you move toward him or away from him. What you believe to be true about Jesus is going to determine whether you move toward him or away from him. I would say that our understanding of who Jesus is is essential to experience the Christian life as he intends, which is a life of abundance, which is a life of shalom, of contentment, of being at peace. A.W. Tozer went so far as to say it this way, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Author James Hamilton in his book, The Faces of God, affirms the same. He says, one's view of God is the foundational issue. If that view is valid, it makes for both health and happiness. If the view of God is distorted, it results in feelings of alienation from him, feelings of alienation from oneself, and often feelings of alienation from others. So this, this perception of who God is is a big deal. The bottom line is simply this. What you believe to be true about God is essential to the Christian life. And one of the reasons why this is so difficult for us is because everything around us seems to be telling us the opposite. Everything that is going on in our lives, if you just watch the news, if you just pay attention to what's happening in your own family, in your own community, it seems to challenge Jesus as mighty. And yet Jesus didn't promise us that this would be a pain-free life, but what he did promise is that he would be with us. So what makes Christmas, the most wonderful time of the year, is not a what. It's not about circumstances. It's a who. It's about the personal work of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at what Jesus can do for those of us who might be struggling this Christmas, who maybe are feeling a little more dread than we are hope. The first is this. Jesus as mighty God can comfort me when feeling the sadness of Christmas past. Christmas often reminds us of loss, uh, most specifically the loss of a loved one. Uh, a few months ago, I sat with my mother-in-law at her bedside and I was with her while she took her last breath. This will be our first Christmas without her. There's a loss there, there's a pain. Uh, recently, I had a friend's wife die from cancer. There's a loss there. That, there's, a, there's a pain that does not go away by singing Christmas carols. A friend of mine reminds me, he says, Ken, life is tragic, but God is with us. Life is tragic, but God is good. He's good. I have uh, 
I do a lot of executive coaching and, uh, and pastoral counseling in the area of trauma. And uh, two of my clients had sons who were in the Covenant School shooting back in Nashville uh, back in March, uh, the eight and a, eight, uh, eight and a 10 year old little boy. And thankfully they survived, but a lot of their classmates did not. The schoolmaster did not. It was a horrific uh, shooting incident. And as I've been kind of unpacking this with them over the last few months, the husband, when he was racing to the school where his wife already had gotten to, called her and he said, whatever we find there, God is good. And I looked at him and I said, where did that come from? That's not just something that you just kind of plucked out of the air in a moment as you were racing to school not knowing if your boys were dead or alive. Where does that come from? Well, it came from a clarity of knowing who God is that was the culmination of his day-to-day -day walk with Jesus. Friends, we will not have the resources that we need to get through the difficulties of life if we wait to call on Jesus or to walk with him in that moment. They won't be there. Those resources won't be there in the same way that they are if we will cultivate that, if we will walk with him day in, day out, moment by moment. And that's this invitation to be present to his presence with us. But Christmas reminds us of loss. And, you know, a lot of times we just don't want to go there. We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to feel it because it's so uncomfortable. But feeling sad is not an emotion to avoid, but rather to embrace. Here's why. Chip Dodd, in his book, The Voice of the Heart, says that sadness is the feeling that speaks to how much you valued what is missed or what is gone or what is lost. So the gift that is embedded in sadness, partly, is that it reveals the value that you had of that person. In other words, the degree of sadness shows you how much you cared. And often we can get stuck in the sadness not because it's so overwhelming, which at times it can be, but we often get stuck in sadness because we are unwilling or resistant to moving into it, to moving toward it. The primary gift in sadness is this, comfort. There is no comfort if we do not go into the sadness. That's what Jesus said. Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. There is no comfort without mourning, without grief, without feeling the loss, without experiencing the sadness. That is the gift of sadness. It's not something to avoid, it's something to embrace. Now, feeling sad doesn't change the fact that that person is gone. But what it does do is that it enables us to be, to, for our broken heart to be soothed by the presence of the Lord. It doesn't fix it, it doesn't make it go away, but it gives us comfort. We can't change the past, we can't bring back that which was lost, but we can find comfort in the midst of the sadness if we will just walk in it. And the, the, I think one of the things that we're afraid to do is that if we, if we go into that comfort, we're afraid that it's a bottomless pit, and that it's just gonna suck us in and it's gonna destroy us, and that is just a lie. It's, a, it's an essential part of the process. Mourning requires vulnerability. I must let my guard down. I must allow myself to feel, to cry, to sit with others, to let them comfort me, to let them be with me. Because you cannot grieve alone. A mentor of mine a number of years ago told me, he said, Ken, if you grieve alone, you will always grieve. So how do we share these emotions with others? Uh, let me just give you a couple suggestions. Share what you will miss the most about the person that you have lost. This is a way to grieve, friends. Share, share what you're gonna miss the most or talk about how important that person was in your life. Uh, talk about your favorite memories of that person. Share what you'll miss uh, and what maybe you wish that you had said to that person before they died. A lot of times, these things that have gone unspoken remain unspoken in our hearts and just create all kinds of pain. 
So to share that with somebody else is, I wish I would have shared this with my dad or with my mom or with my friend. Admit that you will miss them. Just deal with that reality and allow yourself to feel that and allow yourself to cry. Let others hold you and sit with you and comfort you as you cry. Ask the Lord to comfort you with his presence. Ask others for help with practical things like meals and chores and other daily necessities that during a season of grieving is difficult to do. And find comfort in God's word. Uh, these are just a few. You know, one of the things that I, have just being a pastor for the last 30 years, is we don't know as Americans specifically how to grieve very well. It's just not part of our culture. Jesus culture, the Hebrew culture, Middle Eastern culture, they know how to grieve. And I think one of the reasons why they know how to grieve is because it's part of their culture, it's accepted. That's, it's not accepted in our culture, especially if you're a man. It's not exclusively to that, but especially if you're a guy, feeling emotion is often perceived or experienced yourself as weakness. It's not an asset, it's a liability. And again, I think that's one of the reasons what keeps why we stay stuck in our sadness, and then it starts squirting out in all kinds of other ways that are even more destructive. If you bury pain, you bury it alive. It will always come out in some form or fashion. So the best approach is to walk into it. It's to deal with the reality of it and to recognize that you are not alone in it. Here's some verses uh, that I think you might wanna jot these down that I have found helpful in my own grieving process throughout a variety of different experiences in my life. Deuteronomy 31, eight and nine, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 56, eight from the New Living Translation, you keep track of all my sorrows, you have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Psalm 145, 18 and 20, the Lord is near to all who call on him. The Lord watches over all those who love him. Isaiah 41, 10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And finally, Romans 15, 13, may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just some verses for you to draw comfort from. Number two, Jesus as the mighty God can help me when feeling the loneliness of Christmas present when feeling the loneliness of Christmas present. I said last time I was with you and Brandon has uh, reiterated it, God created us for a relationship. You and I cannot do life alone. Uh, Dr. Todd Haw is a professor at, up at Biola University. He writes in his book, Relational Spirituality, that we are profoundly relational beings. The absence of close relationships is a health risk factor more important than smoking, obesity, and physical activity and its effects on, morality, on mortality rates. Did you know that loneliness has been, uh, is, is determined to be equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day? That's how destructive it is to the human heart. He goes on to say, close relationships help us cope with stress and meet our needs for social connection. In addition, they are foundational for physical and mental health and for meaning and spiritual growth into the likeness of Christ. There is no health, there is no growth, there is no meaning, there is no purpose in this life without relationships with God and with others. 
It's just the way God designed it to work. And I, I agree with Dr. Hall, and I would say that it's actually impossible for you and I to, to thrive. We can survive, but to thrive in the Christian life alone. It's interesting that the only thing that God said during the creation account back in Genesis that was not good was what? That Adam was alone. Genesis 2.18, it's not good for the man to be alone. And what's interesting is that Adam wasn't actually alone in this particular uh, point in Scripture, that it's uh, the creation of woman came after Adam had already named the animals, and we, we know that animals can be great companions, right, except for cats. Cats, cats aren't great companions, but, uh, you know. Okay, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Just wanted to see if you guys were awake. Right, but animals can be great companions. And there's also the implication that God and Adam walked together during the cool of the day, right? Because that's what he and Eve did. So Adam wasn't alone, but Adam was alone in the sense that there was no one like him. We need our people. We need people like us to be with. Lonely, the loneliness we feel, however, cannot be addressed simply by being in the presence of others. Being around people does not fix loneliness. Pastor and author Trevor Hudson addresses this greater hunger in our loneliness when he says loneliness comes mostly when we are disconnected from others in such a way that we feel ignored, overlooked, or not known for who we really are. It's the painful ache in our hearts for intimate connection, belonging, and companionship. We are created to be known. We have a longing to be known and loved and valued and appreciated and needed. We need the physical presence of others, but specifically we need to be with others who know us for who we really are. They know our hurts, they know our fears, our dreams, our desires. We need to be with people who don't just know things about us, but actually know us. And it's up to us to cultivate those kind of relationships. It's up to us to actually share our hearts with certain people. I refer to this as uh, we need safe feedback. In my book, Unhindered Abundance, that we talked about last time, that we need people in our lives. You don't need a lot of them, but you need some that will give you safe feedback, that will show you empathy and compassion, that will be a conduit of God's grace and love and mercy to you in your pain. When Jesus walked the earth, he did life with the Father and in a community of friends. You know this. He had his 12 disciples, but there was an inner circle of Peter, James, and John. Jesus took Peter and James, uh, Peter, James, and John into situations that he didn't take the other guys. He did, he did life with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus as well. I, I think those were Jesus' like non-ministry friends. So, you know, if you're in full-time vocational ministry, you need non-ministry friends, right? Because you need to be able to let your hair down. I think Mary, Martha, and Lazarus might have been Jesus' like non-ministry friends, right? It's like, hey, we're going to go to Bethany. We're going to hang out with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus because I just need a break. <laughs> From you, Peter, I just need a break, right? <laughs> so the point is, Jesus needed relationships too. And I believe that the local church can be the best place for us to find and have the kind of relationships that we were created to have. We certainly want to have this in marriage, but not everybody's married. So the local church really becomes a family to belong to. Belong to. Now, in his book, Drop in Your Guard, and this is, this is old, but uh, Chuck Swindoll, right, he used to be the pastor up at Evie Free Fullerton, he makes a really interesting observation that I think only he could make about the local church. He says this, Churches need to be less like national shrines and more like local bars. Only Chuck could say that and get away with it. He said, places where you can take your mask off and let your hair down, places where you can throt, where, where your wounds can be addressed. He says, the neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit there is to the fellowship that Christ wants to give his church. It's an imitation dispensing liquor instead of grace, escape rather than reality. 
but it's a permissive, accepting, and inclusive fellowship. It is unshockable. You can tell people secrets, and they usually don't want to even tell others. He says the bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put in the human heart the desire to know and be known, to love and be loved. And so many seek it, a counterfeit, at the price of a few beers. Friends, what, it, what it would it be like if Mountain View was known as a community of people that are doing life together and helping each other follow Jesus? It does not have to be complicated. What kind of an impact could this church, could all of you have in the lives of others in this community, at your workplace, with your friends and neighbors, as being part of a dynamic community where people are just doing life together. They're helping one another. They're caring for each other. They're helping to remind each other who they are in Christ. They're helping each other grow. I think this is what Jesus' desire is for his church, to be the kind of people that create a place where there is unity and harmony, grace and truth, a place where we can be known and valued and loved, a place where we can do life together amid the triune community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you don't believe me, just look at the numerous one another commands throughout the New Testament. I'm going to put them all up on the screen for you. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Romans 12.10, honor one another above yourselves, Romans 12.10, live in harmony with one another, Romans 12.16, accept one another, Romans 15.7, instruct one another, Romans 15.14, greet one another with a holy kiss, Romans 16.16. Do you think the Romans had a problem with this? <laughs> right? When Paul wrote his letters, regardless of to who it was to, Ephesians, Colossae, Ephesus, whatever, it's because he's addressing the problems that were inherent in that local congregation. The Romans were having problems loving each other. And so Paul is like putting the full court press and saying, guys, this is who you are in Christ. This is what Christ desires for his bride, of which you are a part goes on. 1 Corinthians 1.10, agree with one another. Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. Ephesians 4.2, bear with each other. That word bear, actually, the, the English translation is put up with each other. It's exactly what it means. Put up with each other. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Ephesians 4.32, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Submit to one another, Ephesians 5.21. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Colossians 3.16, teach and admonish one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another and build each other up. Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another daily. Hebrews 10.24, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Hebrews 10.25, encourage one another. James 4.11, do not slander one another. 1 Peter 1.22, love one another deeply from the heart. 1 Peter 3.8, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Friends, this is Peter saying this. This is not the same guy, right, that we read about in, in the gospel. Something has happened to this guy because he's been walking with Jesus. It just goes on. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. 1 Peter 5.5, 5. love one another, 1 John 3.11. Let us love one another, 1 John 4.7. We also ought to love one another, 1 John 4.11. Love one another, 2 John 1.5. Do you see what I'm talking about? That is what Jesus desires to characterize the communities that we do life together in. This is what the church can be in this world, a safe place. And Jesus, as our mighty God, has provided each of us with a new family to belong to. You may have come from a great family, or you may have come from a really, really broken, dysfunctional family. Regardless, you need this new family. Years ago, I was, uh, I was a big fan of Farside. 
uh, cartoons. Remember those? And there's this one uh, picture, and it, it showed this huge stadium, and there was this one kid in there with a, with a flag. He was just kind of sitting there all by himself, and the sign over the top said, Children of Functional Families. <laughs> all of us have been broken by the results of sin, whether it's in our family, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in life experiences. It's just, it just is. Life is tragic. But God is with us. And an important aspect to God's solution to our loneliness problem is to find close relationships in the local church. The church is the body of Christ in this world. It is the representation of God's family on this earth, a place of refuge for all who follow Jesus and a place of light for all who don't. And the truth is, the better that we love one another, as believers, the better and more effective and powerful our witness is to a watching world. Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so, that, so you must love one another, and by this all men will know that you are my disciples, how? If you love one another. This may be the most missed evangelistic strategy in our lifetime right here, right here. And finally, number three, Jesus as mighty God satisfies my longing for home. In Christmas future. I don't know what it is. I guess I gotta talk to my therapist about this next week. I don't know what it is about this longing, but man, it cuts me to the core. There is something about the Christmas season that stirs up this longing for home, for, for a, it, it's this deep longing. And, and I'm not talking about being sentimental about this. It's not referring to, you know, nostalgia, but it's an actual ache that runs deep in the soul, deep in the human heart, that chestnuts on a roasting fire and Jack Frost nipping at your nose can't touch. I think this is what Solomon was getting at in Ecclesiastes 3.11 when he says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. God has put a homing beacon inside of each one of us. And that homing beacon goes on. I think at the moment of conception. And we can deny it, we can try to squelch it, we can, but we can't get rid of it. It is there. It doesn't matter if you're a believer or not. That homing beacon is going off. And it's God's way of trying to woo you to him. And if there wasn't a home, that homing beacon wouldn't be there. If there wasn't a reality that there was something else, something more, that homing beacon wouldn't be going off. The very presence of that ache in our soul reveals to us that there is something more. We need to remind each other as followers of Christ that this life is not all there is. It is not. Peter refers to us as strangers in this world. Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven. In Hebrews chapter 11, we see this list of God's people who lived essentially with one eye on eternity, including uh, Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and others. Hebrews 11:13 13 to 16 says, and all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And that longing proves that it's there. It's there. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. How can Jesus as the mighty God provide help in all of this and fulfill all of these promises? Because he's Elohim. He's equal to God. He is God in human flesh. He is God with us. Jesus is the third person of the Trinity. He is the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, 
the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. All things were created by him and for him, and in him all things are held together. He is the Prince of Peace, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Lord of Glory, the King of Israel, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All of the attributes of God are ascribed to him. He is ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful, never-changing, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the merciful and the compassionate, the kind, the holy, righteous, and true God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. He gave his life as the only sacrifice for sin. He died on that old rugged cross, was buried, and rose in bodily form on the third day. He ascended to heaven to prepare a place for us, is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and one day he will come again to judge the world, to set up a literal thousand-year kingdom, destroy Satan and his demonic host for the rest of eternity, and usher in all who have put their faith in him into an eternal state, a new heaven and a new earth, a place where there will be no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain. Jesus offers us comfort, In our sadness for Christmas past, he offers us his presence through the body of his people in the loneliness of Christmas present. And he gives us the living hope that he right now is preparing a place for us. This is Jesus as mighty God. This is who he is. He is the child that was born 2,000 years ago. He is the one that makes Christmas the most wonderful time of the year. Not good circumstances, not the lack of pain and suffering. It's about him. So let us, friends, focus our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us live keeping one eye on eternity and remind each other of all that he has made available to us right here, right now. Lord Jesus, thank you that all of these things, Lord, are true of you, and that you right now are not only interceding for us, not only sitting at the right hand of the Father, but you are preparing a place for us that you have been working on for the last 2,000 years. And man, what you did in six days, and you've been doing now for over 2,000 years, no wonder Paul said what he did. No mind has conceived. It's impossible. That is not pie in the sky. That is our hope because it is in you. You are our living hope right here and right now in the midst of tragedy and hardship and heartache and brokenness and death. Lord, you are here with us. And it's in you that we find our comfort. Lord, it's through your people that your presence is manifest in this world. It is the work of your spirit in our hearts, conforming us more and more into your character to experience your quality of life. And Lord, all that you ask for from us is to follow you and to just be with you. So Lord, would you help us to do that? Would you give us a greater desire to be with you? We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Everything that I've just said has been made possible for us only because Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, lived the sinless life, and paid the price for my sin and yours by dying on the cross. He took our place. And so for us to take communion as kind of the end or the apex of our service here this morning together is entirely appropriate because it gives us the opportunity to remember his sacrifice. And it is the greatest depiction that we have of God's love for us. Jesus says, I love you this much, this much. And he stretched out. And he died on the cross as the payment for our sins. So as we come to take communion, the elements are here up front. Uh, I want you to come just being mindful of what Jesus has done for you. Lord Jesus, as we come to take of the bread and the cup, we're reminded that the bread is your body, which was broken for us. And that the cup represents the blood that you shed, your blood, 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so, Lord, you gave your blood the symbol of your life for us. And so as we now take of the bread and of the cup, and as we do it together as a community, Lord, may we be reminded of not only your love for us, but your presence with us right here, right now, as our mighty God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name.
so much goodness and grace, much more than I deserve. No. God is more than able. God is more than able. We believe that it's true. God is more than able. the Lord can do. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? I won't forget the moment I heard you call my name Out of the grip of darkness Into the light of grace Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life Where there was dead religion now there is living faith all of my hope and freedom is found in jesus name just like
fully praise you it will take all eternity just like lazarus oh you brought me back to life we're gonna sing that again how can i begin how can i begin to thank you for all that you've done for me jesus to fully praise you it will take all eternity just like lazarus What great news uh, that Jesus has brought us back to life, uh, a life where we've been set free. Uh, what Ken talked about this morning is not just an ideal that we hold up and say, I, I hope, I wish, maybe sometime, maybe someday I can get there. No, this is the life that Jesus invites us to. It's a life that's available to you. Uh, but I want to take it a step further this morning that it's not just a life that Jesus invites us to, but this is a community that you can experience this in. You may be here this morning and uh, you've brought in the grief and the sadness of the past, of what's happened, of who you've lost. Uh, I want you to know that this is a community that wants to come around you and surround you and pray with you and walk with you through this season. You may feel lonely this Christmas season. I want to invite you to engage with this community. We aren't just a, a place that talks about being a family to belong to. No, we're, we're that home for the wanderer, where you can find rest if you're weary, where we celebrate and we, we are for the reconciliation of all things that begins with you but does not end with you. And today... We want to invite you to, to be a part of what God's doing here in this community. We want to invite you to that life of freedom that Jesus offers, which is why he came at Christmas. And so if you're here this morning and you just need a pause and you need a moment uh, for someone to pray with you, for someone to chat with you, there are going to be people here on the wings. Uh, we would love to do life with you. But wherever you're at this Christmas, uh, don't go through this season alone. We've got lots of opportunities for you. You may have noticed today, you may have been caught off guard today by the amount of ugly Christmas sweaters. I know some of you are like, this is the best Christmas sweater I have. It's not ugly. Great. Enjoy that. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Uh, but we want to invite you to get connected this Christmas, which is why we're doing things like ugly Christmas sweaters, which is why we want to invite you out in the lobby to decorate some Christmas cookies, enjoy those Christmas cookies. Um, but also coming this week is our annual Christmas nativity. Now, if you're here last year, uh, you know what a special, special time this was. Uh, we've got live animals. We've got live Mary, jo Mary and Joseph and 
even baby Jesus, not like the real baby Jesus, but somebody who's playing, no, tough crowd, okay. <laughs> but that's happening on Tuesday and Wednesday this week right here. Uh, we would love to, to hear from you. If you are coming, you can register online, mbc.life slash Christmas, and then we are just a couple of weeks away from our Christmas Eve service. Those service times for Christmas Eve this year are at 9 a.m. and at 1045 And this is a perfect opportunity for you to invite someone, to bring someone, hey, join me this Christmas Eve at my home church, uh, Mountain View. And we would love, love, love to meet your friends, your neighbors, your family. Somebody needs to hear the hope of Jesus this Christmas. You know somebody who needs the community of this church family this Christmas. And Christmas Eve is that opportunity for you to bring someone with you. So make plans, be praying about who you can bring and God bless. Have a great, great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Born, and he shall